Good morning. Let's stand as we open up in some praise and worship today. We give you our voices. We give you our praise. Lord, we thank you that in your word you promise to be with us as we gather together and lift you up. So we thank you for that promise. We stand on it today as we worship you and praise you in 
Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today yourself to me and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my
Father, today, even as we look at your worthiness and your holiness and how vast and how great you are, how big you are, the creator of the universe, the one who flung the stars into place, God, today we also recognize that you are in every detail of our life. Father, that you haven't forgotten about one issue in any of our lives. And Father, I know that's hard for us to grasp and to wrap our heads around how big you are and yet how concerned you are for the smallest of details in our life. So Father, I pray uh, that we can receive the bigness of who you are, the massiveness of your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness, Lord, your goodness, Jesus. I pray, Father, that we will learn how to receive that into the small, small crevices of our heart the smallest, darkest places that we try to keep hidden from you or from others at times. I pray, Lord, that we would just allow you, help us to allow you to come and just penetrate any and every area of our lives. And Father, grow us in our belief that you actually are interested in the details. And you're not just a macro God, that you're also a micro God. You're looking at and you're here to help us in every small area of life. Father, we just thank you for that. We do thank you for your holiness. We do recognize your worthiness. We do stand in awe that a God of all creation loves us and remembers us. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated at this time. I do want to take time uh, just to go back into prayer in just a moment here. I want to share news with you. We received word uh, last night that Pastor Ralph Volpe, 84 years old, went to be with Jesus yesterday afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know Pastor Volpe, he pastored here at Central for 36 plus years. He started here in 1968 all the way up through, I believe it was 2003, uh, he pastored this church. So the building that you're sitting in, the scroll across the parking lot, the ministries that have been here for decades and decades, for the most part, are because of his leadership and what he's done uh, at Central. He pastored the church when he took it over. It was about 125 people. And a couple years later, they held what was called Miracle Sunday. Uh, if you know where our nursery and preschool is, the, the, the nurseries in the back, the preschool there, that used to be our entire sanctuary, that building. And it fit, I think, like 200 people. We had 125 people. And a uh, representative came in and believed for Miracle Sunday. And that Miracle Sunday, they had over 500 people present for a, a church that could fit, I think, like 200 in their seats. I don't even know how it worked out. Those were the numbers. Uh, as he pastored here, he pastored the church really to about 700 people at one time and just continued uh, to minister through outreach and through intimate ministry. For those of you who knew Pastor Volk, he seemed to have this ability to be in like two, if not three places at one time. Like I don't know how he was somewhere visiting somebody at six o'clock in the morning. Then we heard stories about him praying with this new, new uh, student almost every day at CCA when they first came, but then he would have been leading a Bible study. He, he honestly ministered tirelessly, tirelessly to multiple generations here at Central. And it wasn't just inside the church. He was a pastor of this community like no other. Like there was a day, I am not exaggerating, there was a day when I was first a pastor here and Pastor Volpe retired, you could go into most businesses, most restaurants. I know every single gas station because I've talked to them the township building, the police station, and you could just say this, Pastor Volpe. And if they were Italian, they'd go, oh, Pastor Volpe. They, they added the E on the end. But everybody, they would just have a smile on their face, and they would be able to tell you stories of how he impacted their life. 
And I'm not telling, I'm not saying like he was nice, he was a man of God. I mean like specific stories. I remember this one time, you know, Pastor Volk came into the office and he just spent hours with me or, I mean, just very specific ways. A lot of those people have retired and some of them have been uh, gone to be with the Lord too. But I know of even specific stories of very well-known figures of a former generation that he personally, personally led to Jesus. And these are people who you might think, oh my goodness, they were probably far from God. And God gave him, and these are big business owners, musicians in the area that he gave face-to-face encounters with and he led them to Jesus. And they're in heaven now because of Pastor Volk. And when you just think of like, I was talking to Sharice, she's out of town today. I was talking to her last night and I was like, it, it almost seems like unfair to me. People who live this life and run their race so well can't have like thousands of people at their funeral. Just honoring the man of God that he was and honoring their family for supporting him in his ministry. It's, you know, it seems like at that time of life, other people that they've impacted have already gone to be with the Lord. So oftentimes, you know, it's a smaller service. I know it's not about this service, it's about honoring him. I think about like how much he knew the word. If any of you have ever received an email from him, it was like, no joke, a sermon in an email. You just keep strolling, scrolling, just verse after verse, a few of his own words, and then verse after verse. He loved the Lord. He loved the word. He loved to preach and teach. He loved to spend time with people. But if I will remember him in one way, it would be his lifestyle of prayer. This man loved to pray. He got in touch with God through his prayer life. Just a true intimacy with the Lord that you don't see oftentimes anymore. When his wife, uh, just a year ago or so, went to be with the Lord, Pastor Volpe uh, was with him at the luncheon afterward, and he said, well, I'm going to spend, he goes, I guess I'm, because he took care of this church for, you know, 36 plus years. A few years after he retired, he started taking care of his wife, uh, who, who was in, uh, in declining health. And he told me at that lunch, and he says, well, he goes, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in intercession for the people of God. Now, if anybody else that I know would say that, I'd probably say, you, maybe you'll spend an hour in intercession you know, a day, and I honestly believe he would have, he had spent just hour after hour after hour praying for the people of God, praying for you. He, he prayed for us more than you could ever believe, even after he moved down to Florida. So I'm saddened in my heart, but I'm so happy. Like we, I know that we get rewards when we show up in heaven. I know God loves us the same, but I just feel like the party was just a little extra special when Pastor Volk came to hug Jesus and embrace him for the very first time. So, I mean, it's an, it's an honor to pastor a church that he laid the foundation for <clears throat> and the legacy that he left. I mean, this guy, <clears throat> he's a spiritual giant. If you didn't know him, he's a spiritual giant in this area. <clears throat> so I'm so happy for him. I'm sad for his family. And we're just gonna take a moment to pray. Father, Today, I, I, I just thank you. I, I offer up a prayer of thanksgiving that you chose to put a man and a woman on this earth like Pastor Volpe and Carol. Father, I thank you that you've given us a living example uh, with no exaggeration of a man and a woman who actually walked out the Beatitudes that we just talked about last week. Father, I thank you that we have a person to look at who was poor in spirit, who did know how to mourn over sin and unrighteousness who was a peacemaker, who was pure in heart, who did hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, I just, I thank you. I offer up thanksgiving to you for a life that was well lived and a race that was well run. I thank you that even the building that we stand in today and sit in and worship in was a vision of his to have here. I thank you, God, that our school, celebrating 40 years of Christian education this year, is in place because of his vision. I thank you, God, the Family Life Center, the Rock Student Center, our office complex, all being overseen as this campus has expanded to touch the lives. God, I thank you for those people who we don't know that are in heaven because of him. The guys that would pump his gas, the waitress that would... Uh, that would wait on him every Thursday as he met with those lost men from the community at Shelley's Pike Inn on Thursday mornings. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the people that are in heaven because of his ministry. 
And Father, we thank you for the ground that he's laid. We thank you for pastors that came before him and pastors that came after him, Lord Jesus. And we just pray uh, that we would do his life and legacy justice by living a life well lived and running a race well run. God, I pray for uh, his family at this time as they're grieving but also celebrating. We pray that you'd cover them with your peace. Cover them with your presence, Lord Jesus. Give them so many good memories to just celebrate, to honor, to laugh about. Father, we rejoice that there was a party in heaven when he came home. He was reunited with you and reunited with his wife. So God, we just thank you. We ask for your blessing upon that family, for those who were close to him and Carol. We just ask that you touch their hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for letting me share, Pastor David. Welcome and good morning, everybody. Hallelujah. If you're joining us online, welcome. Thanks for joining us to worship our Lord. If you're in-house and this is your first time, we do have a visitor kiosk right behind the information center here in the foyer. And we'd ask you to stop there and pick up a gift bag so that uh, you can get to know more about us. Uh, please, we ask everybody to fill out a connection card. And uh, if you didn't get a bulletin in-house uh, or if you don't know where to find it online, you can go to centralconnect.org slash hub. Centralconnect.org slash hub. Everybody say that with me. Centralconnect.org slash hub. And you'll find lots and lots of information there. In fact, uh, this past Friday night, you would have seen last week that we were having a joy fellowship event. That's for the just older youth crowd. And if you missed it, you missed a great time. Uh, we were supposed to have a cookout, but it was kind of cold and windy, and so we moved it inside in the rock. And uh, at the last minute, uh, Brother uh, Sonny Gump and Pastor Jim Lev Coolidge called a guy who came and did karaoke with us. And, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Willie Nelson showed up. Uh, well, and Jennings came and dedicated a song to uh, Bob Atkins. Bob, if you're watching, you got uh, a song dedicated to you. Uh, Elvis showed up. Uh, George Strait, I mean, it was really, uh, we ran the gamut uh, of, of guests that came. And we missed Kevin Ryan. You would have had a great time, brother. But uh, you would have seen that if you looked at centralconnect.org slash hub. If you went on there now, you would see the church is looking for a full-time uh, bookkeeper and a full-time uh, facilities manager, among a whole bunch of other things. So avail yourself to that. Uh, this morning, we're going to check out our announcements. All right, people, this is one of the only times in service that we're going to ask you to pull out your phone. Make sure you visit centralconnect.org slash hub today to fill out your connection card so that we can know you're joining us. You can also do a lot of other things on here, like submit a prayer request, sign up for weekly emails, and see what other events are happening at Central. Under ministries and events, you'll see sweets and songs. Central Women, this is for you. Bring a friend and get ready to eat some yummy desserts and soak in the presence of the Lord this Saturday. And students, this Wednesday is See You at the Poll Night at The Rock. If you're unable to make it to your school to join in this national prayer movement, that's all right. You can join us at 7 p.m. at The Rock for a special night of student prayer. For all this info and more, visit centralconnect.org slash hub. Uh, centralconnect.org is getting a lot more traffic. I do have a couple of special announcements uh, regarding outreach. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we took up an offering for the hurricane relief through Convoy of Hope, a great ministry. I love this ministry because it's helping people who are really desperately in need, uh, you know, through no fault of their own. And we raised $16,700. So praise the Lord. 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's more than one and a half times what our goal was, so praise the Lord about that. And then uh, we do have some, we call them blessing baskets in the, uh, in the foyer. If you know of somebody who just, maybe they're without a job or a neighbor, you, you know, seems like they might be in need or you're not even sure, go ahead and take a blessing basket. You can add to it, but there's uh, stuff in there to, to just bless somebody with. And that's just as an outreach, just be Jesus uh, wherever you go. Uh, this morning, we're going to prepare our hearts to receive offering. We do have uh, connection boxes uh, in, in the back of the foyer there, at the back of the each exit to, uh, to give in the offering or to put your connection card. But uh, this morning, let's prepare our hearts as Devin tells us why she gives. My name is Devin Strimmel, and this is why I give. I'm reminded of the scriptures which teach that we will reap what we sow, and that includes our finances, but that's not the reason why I give. I know everything I have is a gift from God, and it all belongs to Him. 1 Corinthians 5.10 says, But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out His special favor on me, and not without results. I give to God for the same reasons why I give to others, from a heart full of love. And in return, God has done far more abundantly than I have ever asked or imagined. Just last year, I was faced with a financial trial where my bank account was hacked into. I was unable to recover the money that was stolen, but I chose to stand firm in faith, not being moved by my circumstances, believing God would not only give me back what was taken from me, but even more than that, I never stopped giving and believing in His faithfulness. Even when I couldn't see it, God had a plan. And a few months later, He opened a door for me to also become a teacher for my school district cyber program. Now, not only am I getting back more than I lost, but I have been given an opportunity to bless and reach more students with His light. My obedience to giving back to the kingdom of God what is rightfully his has not only blessed me with more than enough, but more importantly, my obedience has given me more opportunities than I can count to extend God's loving kindness and bless others. In the end, it all comes back to love. I give to the kingdom of God because he first loved me. enjoyed watching those videos. I don't see them until you see them. Uh, so it's just been great over these last three weeks to hear from individuals and families of their own heart rather than uh, just hearing from the pastors here. So we're going to enjoy those, I think, throughout the rest of uh, this month and next month. And I'll uh, just continue to receive from our church family. So uh, this week I was planning, we're continuing our unpopular series, and I was planning to move to a new topic. And as the week went on, uh, some different things had come up, and then the Lord really impressed it on my heart to stay within the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So we're going to go for it and see what the Lord wants to do uh, through this. Th this unpopular series is all about confronting the ways of the world with the ways of his word. It's, it's, it's confronting the attitude of having man's approval outweigh God's approval in our life. I do feel like the Lord had said um, several weeks back, several months back in this season that there is a time coming where casual Christianity is not going to cut it. For those who say, hey, I'm just satisfied coming into a church or watching online for an hour and a half and then that's all the time that I follow Jesus, that the tension will get strong enough in life, that the attacks of the enemy will get strong enough that you will not remain effective if you're not actually following Jesus in your everyday life. So I told, I told our church family last week, I'm not mad. There's no angst in my heart. This isn't judgment. Uh, I just feel like the Lord needs, once this message 
preached in this hour so that we can mature as followers of Jesus. See, right now, if you look at it, in the world, the church is looked at as being irrelevant in many areas, even weak or judgmental. Like the press that we get and the media we get, it, somehow they distort a message and say, well, Christians are homophobic and they're against this and this and this. But I believe what the Lord wants is for the church to rise up in this hour, to once again be a center for healing, a center for restoration, a safe place for people to come where they're not thinking we're against them, but we're actually for them, that we want to help them be restored to the value that God has in their life. But many times that takes living a life that's unpopular. It takes doing things that goes against the grain of society. So last week we put out uh, these yearbooks and we talked about how, you know, when you scroll through yearbooks, oftentimes you think about who the popular kid was, who the, the famous athlete was in your school. And, you know, that still exists today. There's still the popular kids in school. Maybe there's that cool guy at work or that mom on the sports team, you know, where your kids play. It might seem to have it all together. It's weird when you look at popularity and influence, how sometimes people will give ideas that are like completely outrageous, like not smart at all, but people will follow them just because they're looked at as being popular or liked. I can remember in high school, I had, you know, seven or eight really close friends, and one was more popular than others, and, uh, you know, we kind of looked to him, and, and he would talk the loudest and the most and the fastest, and it's like, whatever he said, you know, we, we would do eventually. But I remember times where we were talking about what we were going to do on the weekend, and like five of us would have like really good ideas, and this, this other individual would say something, you're like, this is dumb. Like, this is going to get us in trouble, and who would we follow? That person. We're like, okay, we'll just do what you say because we're going to follow you. Now, it seems humorous now because I'm like years removed from it. Unfortunately, we didn't get in too much trouble. But that still happens today. There's voices in society that are speaking, and the masses are following them. And we know if we just stop and think we're going down the wrong path, we know that we're going to end up in the wrong area. We have to confront those voices. I'm not saying people, I'm not saying fight against people. I'm talking about what the enemy's trying to do. We have to confront it with the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. You know, sometimes you feel like, well, I witnessed to this person. I shared about Jesus to this person, and they denied me, they declined me, whatever it is. Listen, Paul's saying it. The message that we carry of the cross is foolishness to those whose hearts are hardened. It says, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. And as scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. See, some people right now have that message of politics, and others have a message of protest. Others have a message of protection against COVID. We have been given the message of the cross. We have been given a message of power. So yes, be involved in politics. Yes, stand up for what you believe in. Yes, live a safe and healthy life. But those aren't going to solve the problems of our country. Those aren't going to solve the problems of people's lives. A move of God is the only thing that's going to solve those problems. So be involved, take action, all those things. But remember, we have been given a commission to present Jesus to people. And I believe that's why he's saying it is so important in this hour for us to grow up, to rise up and be ready to reset the standard of morality, reset the standard of purity, reset the, the, the standard of what holiness looks like. Now, I was a very young kid uh, when the holiness movement was really making its way out. So I didn't, I didn't grow up in a church where you couldn't go to movies, you couldn't dance, couldn't play cards, like all these things. I'm not talking about a holiness movement where you're, you're living by law, where you're living by traditions of men. I'm talking about a purity of heart because you finally recognize just how much God has done for you. And out of that, why would you not want to do anything else but live a holy life? So again, I'm not, I'm not preaching doom and gloom. What I'm saying is this. There's enough things that are out of whack in society right now that I don't think it's going to get much better without a revival of the saints. So God is sovereign, right? He can do 
Like whatever he wants, wherever he wants, however he wants to. He can just blast us with his power and his grace and we could be weeping, laughing before the Lord, whatever. He can do whatever he wants. But if you look at God's word, most of the time, if you follow his word, most of the time he uses believers like you and me. His spirit moves through us, flows through us as we're living in obedience. So he wants us to be ready, not because, like, he's not sitting up there saying, hey, you better get ready. You better grow up. You're immature. No, it's not that. It's saying if you're believing for an end times revival, if you're believing for a harvest to come in, if you want Central Assembly of God to be a safe place for broken, hurting, addicted people to come and get healing and restoration, we have to have something to give them. Right? So we have to be growing up and mature in the Lord so we have hope to declare to a lost and dying world. That's my heart. That's why I think he has us still on these scriptures. Paul goes on in those verses. In verse 20 it says, So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. He goes on to say, see, it's foolish to the Jews who ask for a sign from heaven, and it's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But he goes on to say, but to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. There will be people who just resist you. There will be people who resist you being a peacemaker, who resist you sharing about the gospel, or who even resist you just trying to build a friendship. And those people will have their judgment day. That's not up to us to decide. There will also be people that if you just continue to love and grow up in your spiritual maturity and have a life of intimacy with the Lord, there will be people whose hearts are softened. And they will let us in and we'll have open doors of ministry, but we have to be ready. We have to be ready. This is my encouragement to you, is you don't have to have all the right words to say. You just have to have the right message in your mouth. Right, you don't, like, please do not create a speech. Like, I, I've been through the train, like, evangelism training before and so on, and you have these me scriptures memorized, you have these questions to ask, and, like, you enter into, like, a real conversation, and then you flip over to, like, I'm now a witness, and I'm, like, you're my project, you're my, you're my target. Please don't do that. Get alone with God and get filled up with him and get mature enough with him that you can minister to people who are hurting. Amen? So Jesus laid out these virtues that we talked about. I'm not going to go into them. I'm just going to review them with you real quick. He started in Matthew chapter 5 with a sermon in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people. The multitudes came to him, and he's saying, now this is how the kingdom operates. So he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hung who those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. He's going on and on and on. And we talked about it last week. That word blessed means happy or highly favored. So he's saying, all, what, he's, what he's doing, he has all these people around. Like I can picture the religious officials that were kind of sneaking in or people who lived for hundreds of years following like all these rules. I'm talking hundreds of rules and laws that were added on to God's law. See, God's law is perfect and holy and right. And then man came in and was like, we're going to add section A, point one, two, and three. It's going to get better because of this. And then somebody else comes along who sits on the other side of the aisle, and they're like, we have to add section B, one, two, three, and four. And by the time Jesus comes along, God's holy and perfect and right law is completely twisted and distorted. So Jesus is basically sitting here. Like I can imagine, like they're all sitting here like, okay, let's hear what he's going to do. This, this guy, new ministry, power, miracles. Let's hear him. And he starts off, and he starts basically saying, all of the ways that you thought were working in life, the ways for success, effectiveness, prosperity, happiness, joy, none of them work. Let me teach you how the kingdom works. And he lays out these virtues about being bankrupt spiritually before the Lord. 
completely dependent on him, mourning over your sin. All of these things he starts presenting are doing what we're talking about. They were completely unpopular, and he was confronting the ways of society. So he lays out these nine virtues, and he's saying, listen, these are seeds that should be growing, like in the greenhouse of your heart. If you guys could picture a greenhouse with me for a moment. It's an environment that is set up on purpose for the perfect uh, environment, atmosphere, space for seeds to grow. So you put a seed in, but you also put in the right soil, the right amount of water, the right temperature, the right humidity, and the right amount of sun that comes in. In that perfect environment, the seeds grow into beautiful plants. These virtues are like the seeds. Later on in, in the following chapters, he talks about this environment, the soil, and so on, which we'll get to later. But he starts to hit on what I would call poisons to growth or poisons to these seeds. It looks like Jesus takes a right-hand turn because he's like, blessed are you of this, blessed are those who this, blessed, 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 blessed. And then he starts going and talking about what appears to be ways of wrong living and what are some solutions to it. What I believe Jesus is saying is this. I've set up how to be happy. I've set up how to have joy. I've showed you the virtues in life. Now let me tell you how the enemy is going to try to work in your heart. And what does he continue to do? He confronts what the way of living was and then tells you what the reality of the kingdom was. See, a lot of us say, well, hey, listen, let's not talk about this. Let's not talk about the sin part, okay? We're in, we're in, we're in the grace moment here, right? We're in the redemption stage. And I get that. But for those of us who love our kids and we say to our kids, do not touch that bottle of cleaner under the sink, and we watch the kid come, and if they would open up the sink and take the cap off and they're just about to chug, would we say to our spouse, you know what? Our grace will cover that. We'll forgive them after they get their stomach pumped. It will be okay. Or would we say, stop! Is that being mean, judgmental, condemning, to stop a child from doing something that's going to destroy them? So even if my grace and my forgiveness, I'll forgive them for making the mistake. I'll forgive them for disobeying me. But will I still try to stop them from damaging themselves? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like that's what the Lord is saying to us in this hour. Be careful of the ways of the world and the sin that can entangle us, the poison that can stunt or kill our growth and our maturity. Be aware of the ways of the world and then rely on the grace of God for healing and restoration and freedom. So let's look at these areas, these poisons. Starting at verse uh, 21 of Matthew chapter 5. He begins to address anger. So what's Jesus saying here? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago. So he's saying this is the way the world was working. This is the way the kingdom works. He says you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Like 100% of the people sitting on that mountain would have like, agreed with that, right? Like of course, Jesus, yes. Those who murder somebody that's wrong, they're going to face judgment. He says, but I tell you. Right, this is, now Jesus has come. Now I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. This might not apply to you, it applies to me. What I've been asking myself over these last couple months is when did I and when did the church stop taking that seriously? When did we decide that murder was still wrong, and of course they're going to face some type of judgment, but anger at a brother and sister that is not reconciled, or that it's not reconciled at least on your end, unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, grudges, when did we stop thinking that there was seriousness to that? That's what I feel like he wants us, he wants to like shake us in his love. And say, listen, you're getting close to the, that, that poison underneath the sink. You're like taking that cap off and you're, you're going to drink it. If you continue to allow your anger at other people, your judgment, your grudges, your unresolved conflict to just go out of check without trying for restoration. And then he just nails it. He says, even if you say you fool to somebody. But think about how haphazardly we are with our words. 
Like they just pierce the soul of another person and we don't ask for forgiveness. We don't go and say I was wrong. What the enemy's trying to do is keep the old covenant of like, hey, just don't kill anybody and you're gonna be fine. And this anger part, especially right now in this country, anger at other people, instead of there being a clear line, this is holiness and righteousness, this is sin and unrighteousness, the devil is graying this entire line out. And now it's wide, it's gray, and well, I could be mad at this person because I'm right and I'm the biblical side and they're unrighteous, so I, I can do that. That's not, Jesus doesn't put qualifications on this. Now, if I was speaking to you out of condemnation and anger, then there would be shame coming upon you right now if you know you're angry with someone. There would be a guilt that is almost like it drives you away from the Father. But I'm like with you. I'm struggling through these same exact verses of like, wow, like, am I taking this for real? Like, if Jesus was right in front of us, would we, would we listen to him a little bit more closely? Or do we just fly through these things when it's in a reading plan? I'll just get, like, the happy part, I'm good with, right? Happy is this, happy is this. But this anger part, I'm not going to touch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to smooth my way over this. So what's Jesus say to do? Sorry, let me go back. Because this is in love and because I believe it's a message for, from the Lord for this church, for this hour, then hope should be rising. They should be like, wow, you know what? I am going to decide to call it what it is. It's sin. Anger at somebody else, unresolved anger is sin. And when you begin to admit that to the Lord, that's when repentance starts. Because repentance is changing the way you think, walking away from where you were toward, toward the Lord. So as soon as you come into agreement with the Lord, guess what? It's like you lock arms with him, and now you're headed in the right direction with him. When you're saying, I'm allowed to be mad, I'm allowed to be angry, and you're throwing your temper tantrum and you're pouting, then you're in disagreement with the Lord and you're not allowing him to help you out of it. Then you realize one of the fruits of the Spirit, one, of the, one, one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. I believe patience is the antidote to the anger, the temper tantrums, and so on. So what's he say to do? Therefore, if you are offering a gift to the altar at the altar, and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. This is so countercultural. What would we say? Offer, what's more important, offering something to the Lord or reconciling? We would say, oh, we're offering to the Lord. We've got to get in the house of the Lord and worship. At that time, they were still offering sacrifices and so on. The temple wasn't destroyed. So there were still Christians and people following him that were still operating as Jewish people that would bring offerings. So he's saying, if you're coming to the temple and you're about to lay an offering here at the Lord as an act of worship, and it comes in your mind that me and somebody else still have an issue, he would rather you leave the act of worship there and go and be reconciled to the person. That's amazing to me. He's saying that is a form of worship just as that is. He says, and that's more important to me than this. Do you know why? I believe it goes back to beatitude. The pure in heart, blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Right? If you have issue in your heart of unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, grudges, whatever, you're not seeing God clearly. So you're here and you're like, God, you're amazing. God, you're wonderful. That person's a jerk. I'm still angry with them. I want them judged. Right? I mean, that's what we're doing. We're presenting something as a holy sacrifice to God, but we have issues in our heart. So the only thing that we have, the only choice we really have is to bankrupt ourselves before the Lord and say, I have issues in my heart, Lord. You're the only one that can fix it. And that's where you go back to that, that beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. You mourn over that area that is less than God's destiny for your life, and then he begins to fix it. Let's talk about lust. It's going to only get more tense from here, guys. So you can, like, take a stretch break if you need to, whatever. I told first service, I don't have any jokes here. I, in, my, in my messages, are they're, like, different colors, verses and headings. And green are illustrations to kind of, like, break the flow and tell a little story, use an illustration. I don't have any of those today. It's just, just what Jesus said. We got to deal with it. <laughs> so you've heard... That it was said, verse 27, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in her heart. 
Lust is a poison that will ruin the cultivation of maturity in your heart. So I have to ask myself the question. I asked the church, the body of Christ, when did we stop taking this sentence seriously? Why do we still qualify it as if you've had sex with a married woman or man, you've committed adultery, but if you look at half-naked men and women on your television shows and in your movies, it's not adultery? Like, I'm asking you as a pastor to survey what you allow in your eyes. Survey the shows you watch, the movies you watch. I have three out of four of my kids in here now that can tell you. We, we're not just, like, legitimate about what shows we watch. It's not because we're a pastor. We don't want junk in our eyes. We'll change, we'll change the channel on most commercials that are crude. If you know something's coming up and it's like, okay, so if the show doesn't get you the commercial, though, I'm not saying be paranoid. I'm saying if there's somebody on the screen that has very little clothing on or the subject is one of immorality, I find it hard to believe that most Christians can stare at it over and over and binge watch this and feel like they're going to be fine at the end. I, I, I don't, maybe you can do it, but I, I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't be a lustful look eventually. And then Jesus is saying, when you look lustfully, the, 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 the act of adultery has already happened in your heart. Right? So again, I don't say this to condemn. I know the statistics in the house of God, in the church, men and wom- women who are addicted to pornography. So it's not just the movies, though. I think sometimes movies and television shows, we let that slide because, like, there's still some clothing on. I'm sorry if I'm getting too graphic for you. But if Jesus is saying, you've committed adultery in your heart, if you look less fit a woman, like, let's talk about this. Let's not shove this aside. So I think men and women alike need to come to a point of admitting, once again, let's take this gray line that's so wide, and let's narrow it down to there's righteousness and holiness, there's unrighteousness and sin. You're standing on one side. Well, she's my friend, but I look at her lustfully. That doesn't work. And it can go both ways. So that can cause an immense amount of condemnation, guilt, and pressure, or it could cause an immense amount of hope to rise up. Because anything Jesus commands, he absolutely supplies the grace to fulfill that commandment. One thing that I've found, like in this area and other areas of my life, is this. Is once you come into agreement that it is God's will for you to walk in purity, you start believing that he's actually working in your life. There's a scripture that says, so as a man thinks, he is. So when you, you might say, well, I'm stuck in this, I'm locked in this, I want out, but I can't. Start believing that God has a will for your life to walk in purity. That he's not against you, that he's for you. That there is a solution to this. There's healing from it. And then you can understand, like, if it's God's will, then he absolutely is providing me a way out. So I offer you myself, my wife, other men and women in this church, we will find them to walk alongside of you, admitting that none of us have it together. We are all people on the same level of growing to become more Christ-like who can encourage one another and lead one another to purity. Amen? This would have been a nice time for a joke, but we're going deeper. Matthew 5, 31. It has been said that anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What was happening in those times is this. They, they created all these laws. So the Bible's true. It says God hates divorce, okay? But then they created all these extra laws that really anything a guy wanted to do to say, you messed up, you weren't clean, you didn't treat me this way, he could offer her a certificate of divorce and get out of the marriage. So a lot of times the church will stand so strong on the hatred for divorce that they miss what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying, yes, God hates divorce. But what he's doing is he's, prote- he's, he's declaring his protection over marriages. 
He's saying, fight for the covenant. Fight for the marriage. Do what you have to do. Stop making excuses about any certificate of divorce that you think you want to give that other person and fight for your relationship. That's what I believe was in Jesus' heart at that moment. But again, I believe that there are marriages who are hurting that are, are afraid, like scared to death to come and tell somebody else because the church is, well, God hates divorce. God hates divorce. He hates divorce. You know what? He also hates, he also hates when people are hurting because of abuse and abandonment and adultery. His heart is close to the brokenhearted. And that doesn't make excuse for divorce. It gives empowerment for restoration. So what should be happening is there should, there should be a trust with one another, again, to say, we don't have the perfect marriage, but we know we're committed to staying married. You guys are, are doubting your marriage right now. Let's work together. Let's see what Jesus can do in the protection of the covenant. Let's go to verse 38. talking about the need for us to justify ourselves. I talked about this a little bit last week. It says, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. I do not believe these verses. Like, I, I was a kid reading these one time, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this. Like, if you're in the playground, someone comes up to you, he's like, whap, and you're like. <laughs> so there's very literal teaching that Jesus has, and then there's also called something called hyperbole. When he says, if you look lustfully at another woman, you commit adultery, it's pretty plain. I was going to say plain English, but it wasn't English. This here is an exaggeration of something. I don't believe he wants, he, he wants people to just sit there and get pummeled in a fight. He's saying this, take what the world does and react completely different. So if the world, if somebody in the world gets smacked in the right hand, they come back with a right uppercut. I'm going to hurt you worse than you hurt me. I'm going to show you never treat me like that again. And he's saying, respond differently. Respond in love. Respond in peace. Respond with an attitude that I will be unified with you if you treat me with that respect. And what happens in these situations when we slap back, spiritually speaking, relationally speaking, then we take on the position of the judge. I used the illustration in one of the services last week, but I just want, I want the image to be burned in your memory. Um, Levi, do you mind coming up to be Jesus? He's my son, so. All right. So, oh, actually, come out, come out of the seat of my heart here real quick. Okay, so I'm sitting on the throne of my own heart before I know Jesus, right? I'm the judge. I'm the one that's going to tell my life where to go, all right? I surrender my life to Jesus, so I step off of the throne of my heart. I ask Jesus to come to live in my heart through the Holy Spirit. He's now on the throne as my Lord, my Savior, my grace giver, my mercy giver, all those things. But he also sits as the just judge of my life. If I have removed myself from that seat, that means I can't, um, I can't protest for justice in my own life anymore. I have to trust him to give it to me and him to provide it. So watch what's ha what happens. Somebody comes up, spiritually or relationally speaking, they come and they, they slap me. If I don't respond in a Christ-like way as he would want me to, what I'm actually doing quietly is saying, um, Jesus, Please be my Lord and my Savior, but I'm going to sit here as judge for right now. So you, crit you criticize me on, on social media, I'm coming right back at you. You lie about me, I'm going to lie about you. You do me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. As a Christian, when we do that, we push Jesus out of the seat of the just judge. And guess what? He can't supply justice for us now. He can sovereignly but we've pushed him out in our life in that area. And we say, I'm going to take care of justice in this situation. And Jesus is saying, you all see how this is working out for you? It's not. It's not. So 
it's not just being mistreated in any, you know, area of life. I'm saying when, you, when something's coming against you, you say, God, I'm trusting you to be the judge in my life and provide justice where necessary. Then we allow that to flow even, evenly throughout our life. Thank you, man. You guys all right? Verse 43. You've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Some of the stuff we've already just hit on. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Like if social media was only around when the Pharisees were there, oh my goodness, the people that would have gotten bashed, degraded, all those things. But what's happening here is he's saying, again, you think you know to love these people and hate these people, but I'm saying Find the people that hate you the most and love them back. So this is my challenge to you. I know this only might be me, and maybe this doesn't apply to anyone else. But if there's somebody in this room that doesn't like somebody in their life, like they just, like they really irritate you, get on your nerves, whatever. Nobody's laughing, so maybe it's not, maybe it's just me, I don't know. <laughs> what I want you to do, and like, you don't even have to pray about this. You already know who it is. 21 days, give it three weeks from today to pray for them and see if your heart doesn't change. This is the catch. You're not allowed to pray these prayers like this. God, please change them. Please make them nicer to me. Please help them to help me. You know, none of that, none of that. Because that's exactly what the Pharisees did. God, I'm happy I'm not like the rest of them as I sit on my high horse. That's not, no, I'm saying God, I know that they're unemployed, and I'm asking for you to give them a job. I'm asking for you to prosper them more than they've ever been. Give them a job that will fulfill them and make them happy. Father, I know that they have a, a bad knee, so I pray, God, that you would heal that knee. Let the presence come into the room so much that they know that God's healing power is there. Father, as they're driving, if they're getting angry, or if they're even thinking about me, let them know how much you love them. And now you're praying out of like a right frame of mind. I'm telling you, after three weeks, I believe the Lord's going to change our hearts. I'm going to share one more and then we'll close up. He goes on in Matthew chapter 6. I'll talk about that very, very briefly <clears throat> about some private things. But I just want to share one other area in Matthew chapter 7. He goes, okay, do you need a stretch break? You can stand up if you need to. This one I, I just feel like is so pertinent. I didn't have it in my original notes. But it says this, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now when I, when I look at this, and then he goes on actually to talk about how do you look at the speck of sawdust in somebody else's eye when you have a plank in your eye. How can you go and say, let me get that sawdust out of your eye when you have a plank to remove? First, remove the plank from your own eye so you can see clearly. So when I think of these verses, I ask myself this too. Like, am I living in a way that I am casting judgment and forgiveness onto everybody else in my life in a way that I would be pleased with God treating me the same way? Like we, Jesus is teaching us we have to take this serious. You know what I like about these verses? Number one, they, they make me really, really uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm just being very honest with you. Like I, when I read these verses, I'm like, okay, I'm really serious about these. Now. I'm not going like, to fly over them. I personally struggle with, okay, God's a God of grace and redemption, and we're completely forgiven, so there's no condemnation for those who believe. And yet Jesus is teaching, if we're judging others, there's going to be some type of judgment coming back on our heart. Like our heart's going to be impure, twisted up. What I've noticed about this is two things. Number one is I'll start to try to make like a lot of excuses and justify. Well, I am forgiven of all my sins, so I'm going to stand before God, the righteousness of God. I'm completely pure and clean. I'm the bride of Christ. So that, that really can't happen. And, uh, you know, and even if it did happen, like there will be grace and forgiveness in the end. And what I've learned is this, all of those excuses and all of my reasoning was to try to get out of not judging other people. So then I have to rectify with this somehow. Okay, now I have to live what Jesus is saying. You know what it does to me personally? It makes me come to an end to myself. Why? Because I can't do that. I, I can't do it. 
I can't live a life that's not judgmental toward other people in my own right. So it draws me right back to what? A place of being poor in spirit, being meek, mourning over my failures, knowing that only Jesus can fix this thing in my life. I said it last week, I'll say it again. Do not make these things a checklist, please. Please do not say, I'm going to try really hard on this one and this one and this one. Let these things be impossible statements to you, commands that you could never do on your own. So it's not a step-by-step fix-me guide. It's a path back into the presence of God to ask him to do a work in your heart. In fact, Jesus lays these things out. Adam, you can come up. He lays three things out. I'm just going to briefly touch on them. In, in Matthew chapter 6, he talks about giving, praying, and fasting. He talks about when you're giving to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that your giving is done in secret. And your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And he goes on to talk in, in, in verse 6 about when you pray, go into a room by yourself and talk to the father. And when he sees what's done in secret, he will reward you. And in fasting, that's giving up food for a spiritual purpose. He says, put oil on your head and wash your face so nobody knows you're doing it. But your father's going to see what's done in secret and he will reward you. How this confronts the ways of the world is this. Uh, Good doing, um, kind acts of generosity, all those things are done for the world to see. Now, there's so many ways to celebrate and you know, publish these things on media. And what happens even as Christians is we, we start to want to have our good deeds be seen. There's that temptation of like, I haven't gotten an attaboy on my back recently. Like maybe I'll just let somebody know about it. And Jesus is saying this, develop and cultivate a private life of maturity with me so that then you can one day bear fruit publicly. Something has to happen privately with the Lord or what you do publicly is going to be fake. It's going to crumble eventually. So I love this because Jesus doesn't just teach it. He lives this lifestyle. Like he, it says that he withdraws often to be with the Father, to pray, to be with intimacy with him. Jesus is never worried about receiving accolades. He's not worried about his reputation. Jesus doesn't have an image to uphold. He lived his life. For others, for the sake of others. And I want us to be positioned to do that very same thing. But I believe it takes a private cultivation. I love this because he's saying here, he sees what you're doing in secret and he rewards you for that. Well, guess what happens? If we do things to be noticed by the public, we've already received our reward, Jesus said. So go ahead and enjoy that reward. But the things that you do in private, you'll receive a reward. Now, as a church family, you might be wondering, well, Pastor David just celebrated what we gave to, you know, Convoy of Hope. As a church family, there are absolutely times where we will call for public times of giving, public times of praying, public times of fasting. It's called a corporate movement. It's to encourage one another and to celebrate what God's doing in the body. But Jesus is saying here, there's a private, individual, personal cultivation of growth that must go on also. Why? No pride. No comparison. No competition. If there's no competition, there's not a winner and a loser. No media coverage, so the story can't get twisted. It's just you and Jesus. I remember being in Bible studies when I first came here, nervous when I was asked to pray, especially if a pastor was in the room. How is my prayer going to sound? Right? If we all came up, like some churches, if we all came up and gave our offerings in these open boxes, how's my offering going to look to other people? There's a reason why Jesus is saying, do this stuff in private. You don't ever have to think how somebody else is doing it. You can learn from other people. But God, do I sound spiritual enough to you? Are you serious? He wants to be with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to graft us and change us and transform us into his image. This is why we're doing all of that. So I won't read it. I'll just summarize it. At the end of this sermon, Jesus said, for the man who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a man who builds a house 
on a solid foundation, on a rock. The storms will come, the streams will rise, the wind will blow against it, but it will not fall. He goes on to say, so on the other hand, a man who hears my words but does not put them into practice. It's like a man who builds a house on sand. Guess what? The same storms are going to come. The same streams are going to rise. The same wind is going to blow. But for that man's house, it will cause a great crash. So I'm not here to continuously remind you that storms are on the way and that the streams are going to rise, the wind is going to blow. Any level of common sense will tell you this is where we are right now in our culture. So now we have two options. And I am fearful, and I've seen it in my own life. I'm just fearful in Western Christianity that we have made life with Jesus about coming to church or watching it online. And we've learned something cool and good message, Pastor. That was a great time of worship. But then we don't actually put it into practice. So this whole entire sermon, Jesus is like, this is how you're happy. This is how you thought things worked, but now the demands are greater, but there's grace. These are attitudes of your heart. Now, if you listen to all this stuff, but don't actually live it out, you will not survive the storm. So I want us again to come to ourselves and say, I don't have the power, I don't have the wisdom, I don't have the ability to do any of this stuff. So God, I need you. I need Jesus Christ to be the rock, the foundation in which I'm building my life. And then when the storms come, we don't fall. The Lord brought me back. I'll close with this. I appreciate you staying patient with me. I know this was a longer message. The Lord brought me back to scripture where it talks about a great falling away at the end times. So I believe there's going to be a great revival at the end times. I believe there's going to be a great harvest of souls at the end times. I believe that's why he wants his bride to be spotless, holy, strong, and ready for that. The Bible does talk about a great falling away. Growing up and learning about uh, the mark of the beast, which has been talked about now because of, you know, the virus and all this stuff. Uh, learning about that, I always thought this great falling away was going to be like really strong Christians who just decide one day to renounce Jesus as their Lord and Savior and to say, oh, Satan is my God now and come and stamp me with 666. I thought it was going to be like this aggressive turning away from God. And the more I look back at how Jesus actually taught how the kingdom operates, I believe that a great falling away will happen person by person who, who, who unknowingly just gets caught in the ways of the world. And because their foundation is one of sand, then this just seems more comfortable than standing up for what's right. And this just seems more easy than standing up for what's pure and righteous and holy. And before you know it, your life has just simply drifted very far from God. But corporately, looking at what will happen if the body of Christ is not mature and ready, is there will be a great falling away. But it might just happen one decision at a time. And what really grieves my heart more is that there very well could be millions upon millions of believers who think that they're right with God. And I remember back in VBS one day I said yes to Jesus, but their lives don't represent it like at all. People aren't going to want what we have if we're not living what we believe. So we wonder why the, the church looks irrelevant to the culture. Maybe we just need to grasp, God, help me to live what I believe. Keep me close to you for these end times. Let's just pray. Father, I just come to you now and I pray, Father, that anything and everything that was said, that we put it in the context that you, Jesus, are providing a way out of any of these poisons. You, Heavenly Father, are providing a way into freedom, God. So I pray right now, in the name of Jesus, that there would be a breaking of that spirit of anger, bad tempers, and impatience. Father, I pray that you would calm our soul. That, Father, the things that used to get us all, uh, all fired up and 
and, and out of sorts, God, that you would allow us and help us to manage ourselves well with the fruit of the Spirit. And Father, for judgments against other people, for anger, for unforgiveness, Father, we've come to the end of ourselves. We cannot do this on our own. Help us to forgive those who have hurt us. And we just declare that you are in the seat of the just judge in our life. We are not going to make this work. We're trusting that you make it work, Lord. So we position our hearts toward restoration. God, I pray for any man or woman that's watching this online or that is in this room that struggles with lust. I pray first and foremost that they would take bold action to block websites, to throw away DVDs, to block channels. Like we can do that, parents. You can block channels. You can have your spouse block channels and put a code on that you don't know. I pray, God, that in this moment we're making decisions in our hearts to just allow that thin line between what is holy and what is not to be seen. And God, I pray that, that those acts would be acts of faith. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, that spirit of lust, that demonic power of immorality and impurity would be gone in Jesus' mighty name, that we would be ones that are called pure in heart, that we would see you, that we would walk in that purity and that morality. But God, we need a miracle. I'm asking Holy Spirit to invade the souls and the minds of those who are struggling and allow them to know this is not God's best for their life. And God, I believe you have a way out. I believe that there's a miracle. I believe that there's purity on the other side of it. I pray for any marriage that's watching or in this room that just feels like giving up. God, I pray that you would just give them hope in this hour. Give them hope. Remind them of how much you love covenant and how much your will is for them to work things out. Remove guilt, remove shame, Father, and just come in your love in these moments. Father, if there's other poisons, if there's other things that Jesus taught that are in our hearts, I just pray that you would allow us to see an end to ourselves in the beginning of your grace, the beginning of your empowerment, the beginning of your healing to happen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I just want you to keep your heads bowed. I'm sorry. Uh, just keep your heads bowed. Just close yourself off with the Lord. If you're in this room today or if you're online and you have not given your life to Jesus, if you are not sure he's actually your Lord and Savior, or if you've been far from him and you just want to come back, if you're in the house today, I just want you to raise your hand. That's a decision you just know is in your heart. Like, I need to get right with God. I need to come back to God. I just want you to raise your hand. We'll be able to pray with you after service and just acknowledge who you are. Anyone in this room at all, for the very first time, or to rededicate your life. All right, if you're online and you want to make that decision, if you go to centralconnect.org slash hub, there's a prayer request button. You can click on it and let us know the decision you make. We will follow up with you here in the next 48 hours. Why don't we stand this time? Heavenly Father, we admit to you that these teachings are hard and they are the unpopular ways, but you are giving us a way where your will is, you are providing a way. So I pray that we'd walk out of here with confidence that you're walking with us, ensuring us that you have the way to the abundant life. So God, protect us throughout this week. Give us favor and health. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 You guys have a great week. Thank you so much for coming.